the chance that you <laughs> the chance that you will die from eating too much at McDonald's is about a thousand times higher, and this is not an exaggeration, this is statistics. It's about a thousand times higher than the chance you'll be killed by some Islamic State terrorism attack. So we are gaining the ability to bring under our control these uh, huge problems. Again, there are still problems, of course, but most of them, when it comes to famine, plague, and war, are the result of human politics and human incompetence, not of human ignorance. If you, again, take famine, there are no longer any natural famines in the world, only political famines. If somebody, if a human being today on Earth dies because they don't have enough to eat in Syria or in North Korea or in Somalia, it's not because of natural causes. It's because some political leader or government or ideology wants them to starve to death. So this is a new phase in the history of the world. We have managed, without any divine help, to bring these three problems under our control. And then the next question that the book Homo Deus asks is, what next? So if we have solved, or in, we are in the process of solving these problems, what will we do with ourselves in the next century or two? And the book suggests that the next big projects of humankind will be to overcome old age and death, to find the keys, the secret to happiness, and to basically upgrade humans into gods. This is why the title Homo Deus, God Man. And I don't mean it as a kind of literary metaphor. I mean it in, as in, in the literal sense that for thousands of years, humans have imagined gods in a particular way. They ascribed particular abilities and qualities to gods. And we are here in a church, and the walls are full of these descriptions of what God can do. And we are now seriously in the business of acquiring these traditional divine abilities and qualities to ourselves, uh, whether it's trying to overcome death and gain immortality, or whether it's gaining the ability to create and design life according to our wishes. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, basically the first thing God does is to create animals and plants and humans according to his wishes, we are now trying to gain this divine ability to ourselves. It's very likely that in the 21st century, the main products, the most important products of the human economy will no longer be just vehicles and textiles and food and weapons. The main products will be bodies and brains and minds. And in a way, we are even reaching beyond what ancient religions ascribed to, to the gods. Because the gods, like Jehovah in the Bible, they could create only organic beings. If you look, if you're a creationist, and you look at the world, so all these animals, all these plants, God created them, and they are all organic. Now, humans are trying to do better than that. We will not just gain the ability to create these organic beings that's been around for four billion years, we are in the process of learning how to create the, the first inorganic entities, inorganic beings uh, like artificial intelligence uh, that ever existed. So in this sense, it's, it's, it's a literal claim that humans are trying to upgrade themselves into gods. Now, in order to do that, we'll have to turn our gaze from the world outside to the world inside. Uh, the huge achievements of humankind in the past, especially the overcoming of war and famine, have been the result of humans gaining mastery over the world outside, over the environment. Um, the next phase will involve trying to gain mastery over the world inside, of deciphering um, the human biochemistry, our bodies, our brains, learning how to re-engineer them, learning how to manufacture them. This will require cooperation between the life sciences on the one hand 
and uh, computer sciences, on, on the other hand, because this will require, this already requires, not just uh, breakthroughs in our understanding of biology, this will require a lot of computing power. There is no way that the human brain has the capacity by itself to decipher the secrets, to process the data that is necessary to understand what's happening inside. You need help from artificial intelligence. You need help from big data systems. And this is what is happening already today, that we see this merger of the biological sciences with computer science. The result, however, may not be the upgrading of humans into gods. The result may be um, the end of humanity, because humanity will create something far more powerful than, than itself. Uh, once you have an artificial intelligence or a big data system that understands you better than you understand yourself, then you're useless. You're irrelevant. Anything you can do, this system can do better. And it's a distinct possibility, it's not a prophecy, but it's a distinct possibility that in the 21st century, most humans will therefore find themselves in a new category, in a new class of, of, of humanity. Just as in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution created a new massive class of the urban working class, the proletariat. And much of the political and social history of the 19th and 20th century revolved around this new working class. So the 21st century will create a new massive class of useless people, the useless class. And maybe much of the social and political history of the 21st century revolve, will revolve around the problems and the hopes and the fears of this new massive useless class. So these are just some of the, a short outline of I might, some of the main ideas of the I might go book. back to predicting inflation in three months uh, shortly, but yeah. <laughs> okay, there's such a huge amount of, of ideas there, but I, I just wanted to kind of just rewind slightly before yes. we go into all these issues about um, this new class of, 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 of human being, or however we might describe it. Um, yeah, well, when you, when you set out on Sapiens, your, mm -hmm. your, your historic look at um, uh, uh, how uh, Homo sapiens have developed um, uh, through their history, uh, was it always seen to you as a sort of two-book project, so to speak? And how much mm. is Homo Deus built on the trends uh, that you defined in um, uh, Sapiens? Because in Sapiens, you, you, you portray um, a world where Homo sapiens put themselves in a position of dominance. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least part of your argument for Homo Deus appears to be that this new supercategory of human being, Homo Deus, will put itself in a dominant position given how Homo sapiens have behaved in the past. And you make some links, for example, in the way that Homo sapiens um, deal with animal husbandry, mm. or don't deal with animal husbandry, to be, to be frank. What are the lessons from Sapiens that you drew out and built into the Homo Deus uh, mm. work? Well, first of all, I, when I started Sapiens, I had no idea I will even have one book, uh, let alone two. Um, Homo Deus is a direct continuation of, Homo Sa of, of Sapiens, but it really kind of wrote itself because I was giving all these interviews and all these talks, and I'm an historian, I really like the past, but the vast majority of the questions were about the future. Like people said, okay, the, the past, but what will happen now that we, you told us about these 70,000 years, what will happen next? So these were, were most of the questions and most of the requests for interviews and, and talks uh, wanted me to speculate about the future. So from interview to interview and article to article, uh, Homo Deus started uh, to take shape. And it is definitely built on the foundations, on the ideas of, uh, of Sapiens. In particular, Sapiens, uh, the book, um, the main thesis there is that what enabled human beings to conquer the planet 
and to turn themselves from insignificant apes into the masters of the planet is their ability to cooperate in large numbers, which in turn is founded on their ability to create fictions and spread them around and believe in them. At the basis of all large-scale human cooperation, you always find some fictional story, whether it's about God or about the nation or about human rights or about money, there is always fiction at the basis. And what I'm trying to do in Homo Deus is see what happens when these mythologies, these fictions, meet um, godlike technologies that for the first time make it possible to start realizing the myth, not after you die in some fantastic heaven, but here on Earth with the help of technology. I'm, again, I'm a historian. I come, my background in the, in the humanities. I'm a terrible technophobe. I hardly know how to turn on the television. I have to rely on my husband to do that. Um, and so I'm not really interested in the, in the technical aspects of big data or artificial intelligence. I just take it for granted. Okay, it can, artificial intelligence will soon be able to drive a car by itself. Don't you need, don't you need to be? Don't you need to be? Some people in the AI market or mm -hmm. in, in AI research would maybe argue that the problem with interlopers coming in mm -hmm. who don't know about the technology and not quite sure how to turn the TV on <laughs> is that how can they make sensible predictions about what AI may or may not do for human beings and to human beings, I think more mm -hmm. importantly, uh, that that's a problem hmm. for, for a historian to come in and make such big, bold predictions on an hmm. area that they're not actually specifically um, expert in. Well, I rely on the experts, and what is interesting, what is vital for me is to try and understand from the experts what is or isn't possible to do with these kinds of technologies. How is not within my field of expertise. And if you try to cover everything, it's impossible. You have to give up something. I think most of the people who are very interested in the future of technology, they are experts in technology, so they understand uh, these technical aspects of biotechnology or genetic engineering or artificial intelligence. But for me, the most interesting questions are not the technical ones, they are the political ones, the economic ones, the philosophical ones. And how can you make sense of what artificial intelligence would do to the economy or would do to religion if you don't have uh, the necessary background in philosophy, in history? Um, I think this is much more important um, to take an analogy from a past uh, technology, nuclear weapons, you don't really need to know how a nuclear bomb works. Maybe there is a demon inside. How, what do I care? I mean, what is important for me is that this device somehow, don't ask me how, this device I know can obliterate a city and kill hundreds of thousands of people in a minute. This is important to know. How, and and this, building on that, you can start thinking about what this kind of weapon might mean for geopolitics or for religion. How does it work is not so important. 